Uh, Brett, uh, I'll just break into uh, th things real quickly here, but I think first and foremost, people would be interested in an update on your NASDAQ short here. So, I mean, we're in another lateral consolidation <clears throat> um, and in a downward trend, so I'm just staying short. It's possible that we'll get a headline, we'll squeeze up higher. Um, the, the, the character of the action right now suggests that uh, we would see another round of lower lows, but obviously we are some of the stuff we're going to talk about, and a chart that I just actually posted will show that there's a lot of hedging in the market, so it really is, you know, it's to, at some point the market will turn, and that will be what happens, and there's really no way to know absolutely for sure. Right now, I'm short in a downward trending tape that is showing me reasonable signs of the technical potential to continue lower, so I'm just sticking with it. All right, and I, th I think a lot of the key items coming up for our discussion here is we've got that May 5 um, tariff headline passed, so that, that was really kind of the tipping point in terms of change in sentiment, I feel, around this, uh, or around the trade talks, which has obviously been a key item for the markets here. We've certainly seen that play out in the China A share names, as well as a lot of the tech names with exposure to the U.S., and re really a continued decline in um, what appears to be the ability to get a trade deal passed at this juncture, as both sides are digging in their feet right now, and uh, that's that certainly led to a little bit of waiting. I, th I think one thing that we can maybe address real quick, and that would be yesterday's Fed Minutes, and I, I saw your comments yesterday, and uh, I, I had a similar commentary, but I think we're both in agreement that those Fed Minutes, you could pretty much toss them out the door for the most part in terms of when I did a search for trade, eight times that term came up, four of them were linked pretty closely to optimism. Yeah, I saw um, the same thing. And, and uh, so, you know, I think that just shows that that's a little bit dated. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get a chance to take a look at the, if it had any effect on the Fed Fund's futures here, but I'm assuming that they're that we're continuing to run right around 70% for a September or December rate cut. Um, no, I think we're about 50-50 right now um, for, for, for September, and it's a certainty, according to the futures, basically, it would appear, for December and January that we'll see, that we will have at that point at least seen one rate cut. What's the general line in the sand, Brett? I forget. Is, is it any time it's been over 60% the Fed's moved, or is it 70? I think it's, I think that it is, the line is that the Fed has never hiked when the odds of that hike are below 70%. I think yeah. that's the, the stat that I've seen. They've never, ever done a hike when they haven't first. And, then, you know, I mean, again, I think it's an interaction. They, they monitor a number of different market measures, that being one of them, to make sure that their message has appropriately prepared the market for what they're going to do. So I think that they feel like if they saw it sitting at around 55 or 60%, odds of a hike, and they know they're going to hike, then they're going to start to message that out there so that by the time you get there, it'll be at, you know, 95% or whatever. So um, I think, you know, we're, we're talking about meetings that are three, four, five out um, in some cases as we start to look ahead to around the next corner. So they're not really, I think, having a conversation with the Fed Fund Futures for December yet, and the market is basically speculating. Um, I think a couple things. One, that this is a... A, a, an age of central banking that's extremely proactive in protecting against deflationary risk and that we've got no real inflationary risk that seems to be pricing into anything. So, yeah, and, and, and we'll get into that a little bit deeper with the New York uh, Empire Philly Fed and the recent PMI commentary too. Yeah, and I think the markets are just pricing in that proactivity. I'm not sure that they're necessarily saying a recession is around the bend in the next few months. Um, but, you know, January is showing some probability of as many as four hikes. So, or but four four cuts by then. So that's you know there is some outside shots that people are taking at the idea that we're seeing a cycle turn right now. Yeah, and uh, I, I would also say that the long term uh, projections for these Fed fund futures rates generally don't work out too well. Uh, no. <laughs> so keep, better keep than that, the Fed's keep, projections, though. I will say that. Yeah, yeah, better than the Fed's projections. Uh, but um, you know, we we want you to keep that in mind. But uh, for now, it's certainly impacting decision-making, I think, moving forward here. So with that, Brett, let's discuss some of the recent indicators. And uh, I, I, I don't think that there's any better way to start off than uh, the Lobo ratio, which we were both talking about, uh, where it's getting towards the similar levels that we saw 
on December 21st at the moment. Um, you posted a chart there, so please, everybody, uh, if you get a chance, check the 1430 comment out from Brett, and he's got a nice link to that chart. And uh, probably a good way, uh, one thing to keep in mind here, Brett, uh, if we get towards the green, that is an extreme um, pessimism, correct? But, right. but it, it's a contrary indicator. So that that's why you'd see that moving up towards the green and towards the red would be an extreme pessimism. Obviously, you could tell looking at that, um, we were in the midst of going down towards that red line, and right around May 5th, we saw a pretty much a, um, a complete uh, change in direction moving towards a little bit more of a pessimistic feel for the markets here. So, Brett, you want to explain this chart to people? Um, maybe just go recap exactly what the Lobo ratio is, and uh, then we'll also compare it to the Robo ratio as well, which I know you use both quite frequently. Sure. So the Lobo ratio, the Lobo stands for large only buy to open put call ratio. So it is only looking at large accounts. I'm not exactly sure what the cutoff is, but it's probably significant. Um, uh, uh, so you're looking at professional market participants and funds and things. Um, and it is the buy to open. It is from clearinghouse data. So it is a not... If it's you 50 see a, contracts or more, right? For, uh, for that, that, may, that may be correct. Something yeah. along the line. Yeah, so you're, you're making an inference there with, with the size of the position. But um, if you are... Uh, uh, so it is a, is a ratio of puts to calls, but it's, it's buy to open, which means it's clearinghouse data. It's not... If you see a big put purchase, you know, that's already paired with an open call position or a, uh, a short put position, then that will not go into this data. So it's only newly established positions in derivatives based on security. So... Um, it allows you to see, I think, the main thing with this chart, to me, this represents, puts uses hedges for open equity share positions in professional traders. So um, if you've got a big, expansive portfolio of different technology stocks, you might buy a bunch of puts on the QQQ if you're worried about a market breakdown. And the the sharp move that we've seen from uh, across the entire spectrum of this, you see it's one of the sharpest in the history that's shown there as far as a single two-week period moving the entire spectrum. Um, that really, to me, is this process that I've talked about as going from one world to another, going from a world where we had a deal nailed down, this is a short-term issue with China, it's just about trade, et cetera, to this dawning realization that we're not within a country mile of any sort of deal, and we've got to uh, go through a long process, and this probably isn't just about getting numbers right. Um, so, you know, basically this is, this is I think, your easiest, quickest measure of looking at how hedged the market is right now. And you'll notice that when you see, look, look at December. You can see December, you see the big valley in the S&P. You see the big down move to the lows when it broke under 2,500. You see where this was. It wasn't too far off from where it is now, and that was when people were really hedged to the extent that the market really could had a tough time going any lower. Um, you can see the hedges, if you go further back, the, the, the spike back from that that's higher was, I think that's the election, um, when uh, Trump beat uh, Hillary Clinton, and you go back a little bit further, and you've got Brexit, and you go back a little bit further, and that's that August crash from 2015 that I actually talked to Jim a little bit about. So you can see where it's transitioned to just in this last two weeks. If we were in the midst of just a a, a straight downtrend that was just getting started, it's not impossible that that's happening, but you can already see some of the stuff I've been talking about. You can already see how much hedging has just slammed into place. People have just immediately slammed into a bunch of big hedges. And it may be that we're in the midst of a bigger deterioration and that this is just the tip of the iceberg for that and maybe we'll cycle out of some of those hedges and then really thump down to the downside. But it would have to be a bigger deterioration on a, on a real core economic level. Um, this We've already kind of done the work of putting people on the defensive. Now, there's further we can go, and some of the other indicators we can talk about, particularly when you look at robo, you see the difference. There's still some spec money in the market, and it's still, you know, it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm short. Um, we can yeah, still move lower. The, robo the market is relatively prepared. The robo, just for people's reference there, is running around right in the middle between the uh, the similar lines that you would see here in the lobo ratio. So it's certainly tra uh, trailing there. And, and the robo uh, is the robo is the retail only. It's the smaller traders. 
Right. And also, just as a quick heads up, we are hitting lows right now in the S&P, so we do continue to watch that action. So, right. uh, But, uh, Brett, also, um, not, not to jump off the sediment survey too early here, because we are definitely going to circle back, but uh, this is in line with our discussion here. And that was from the most recent Bank of America fund manager survey, where they noted that uh, by investors buying portfolio hedges hit a record 34 percent, which uh, which really falls in line with what we're seeing in the Lobo ratio here, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that the, the two are in agreement, and I like to see agreement to believe that something is real. So uh, there's a couple things that aren't in agreement. You know, there's, there's an equity hedging index we've talked about that is sort of middling. Uh, there's a number of things that are middling. Um, yeah. There's not a tremendous amount of action in inverse ETFs, so there's 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 some reason to question this, but but I think that um, the fund manager survey is important and paired up with the Lobo ratio, which is probably the best direct indicator. Now, Brett, how would you view the VIX term structure, which uh, I was looking at, it moved away from an excessive pessimism? Um, that, that's it moved away what... from well, I would say okay. So I, I again this so this is about the timing of uncertainty. Right? right, it's 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 so when when you're in an absolute crash scenario, you get big backwardation on this, and it's moved away from that. But it hasn't moved to necessarily um, pessimism. It's just it's immediate pessimism. It's 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 the relationship between how much volatility there's going to be within the next week or two versus how much there will be three or four months from now. Right, so it may think it may, it may be moving down because there's a lot more volatility expected three or four months from now like maybe the Fed Funds futures are trying to speculate on. Which would bring us out past, obviously, the uh, G20 meeting, which I yeah. think is probably uh, falling on a lot of people's radars, obviously. We got uh, ahead of that June 8th and 9th is the finance minister's meeting, which I think the markets at that point would like to see some sort of olive branch being extended from one of the sides that would suggest that that June uh, end of June G20 meeting is going to be on the table. So that could very well be why that's moved away in the VIX term structure. Would you agree? Yeah, I, that very well could be. And the aftermath of that meeting not really happening, or at least substantively. Right. Um, so uh, if, if, we, if we continue to see uh, a little bit more negative headlines, we could see that revert pretty quickly. Now, do you think that is why... Um, this entire discussion in terms of Lobo hedging, the Bank of America hedge fund sur service surveys, um, why we haven't seen the VIX like kind of really ramp up here despite the selling and the put call ratio staying relatively muted here. I know it's at 120, but we haven't gotten that big 150 plus spike yet. Do you think that's all playing in on why we're seeing the kind of selling that we are at the moment? I I I can't say for sure, but I know that. I mean, generally speaking, and we've talked about this before, when you see uh, selling with a lack of a, a bigger spike in the VIX, it's usually more important um, kind of selling. So, um, but yeah, I think that preparedness in terms of current hedges would explain the lack of panic now, but we're still seeing some selling rather than just hedging too at this point, which is important to important to take note of. Right. So taking a step back then from what we've just discussed, um, what, what we're seeing here is a pretty well hedged, at least on the surface, um, long, uh, on, the, on the large manager, large fund manager side, but not so much on the retail. So there's the potential for a panic sell on the retail here. But what you have to navigate is between are we so well hedged that we are looking at a potential squeeze on a positive headline, or are we under hedged on the retail side that we still haven't gotten that puke yet um, and that really aggressive selling? And that's kind of where we are at the moment, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of different dynamics. One is I think we're getting a lot of um, uh, we've seen, I talked with Jim earlier today about this. If you look at the SPY daily chart, you see an, in mostly white candles for this entire decline. In other words, up, up days, or at least days where when the U.S. market is open, we're rallying, but that add up to a sell-off. And it's an odd dynamic, and one of the problems, I think, is we get a lot of our bad news overnight, and um, 
people come in in the morning in a gaff down, and they load up on shorts, and then there's just some kind of bid there, and you get this big squeak, shakeout squeeze, and then you get the bad news again the next night. And it's kind of been a cycle, and I think that that does add up to possibly a puke ahead. Um, and then I suppose we may see I, – I, I mean, let me ask you this. Do you think – that there is any version of a blink possibility in this administration. A blink, m meaning that they fold and do a um, deal that um, – that Well, they, yeah, that I mean – That I might possibly. not be the big encompassing deal that um, that Trump's hoping for. Is, is that what you mean by a blink? Yeah, I guess when would be the line? If you think of a Fed blink is normally what we have. In this case, I think that it would be – you know, an administration blink if there was a blink, if there was a, a supportive structure. Now, it, I, I'm not sure whether we would see it at any level, but I think that a lot of people are thinking that that's a possibility if we see think, very aggressive declines. I think there is. I think we've seen it in the past on, on different issues, um, you know, uh, but, I mean, they, they, they have been aggressive and dragging their feet. I guess the government shutdown would probably be a fair one to uh, go by. Um, one thing that I was looking at today that I was interested in is I don't know if you noticed the IMF report on tariffs or the New York Fed report on tariffs, Brett, where they were both discussing a bigger impact from the tariffs on, um, on U.S. consumers. And yeah. I, I, and a Goldman Sachs report. Uh, yeah, and and I think and I, I could post these two reports for people uh, after Brett and I get off if you wanted to take a look at it. Um, I haven't been able to go all the way through them, but I do think if you're looking at a blink perspective potential, that if we start seeing the U.S. economy faltering a little bit and China performing well with, through you know mainly government stimulus. Uh, then we could see a little bit of a blink, especially if it's going to be hurting voters. You know, we've certainly seen yeah. that the right. president would go through and make adjustments in order to shore up uh, voters. Now, uh, how are the farmers going to react? That's obviously a key area for um, the president to try to win. He did very well in 2016 in those areas and doesn't want to lose support. So, yeah, I do, I do think that there's a blink potential because we have seen that they're willing to chase the votes. Um, and then, you know, they couch it as it not blinking. I'm sure the Democrats would look to jump on this. But, you know, right now at the moment, I think the administration is doing a pretty good job, too, at really painting China as the villain. And China has been stealing jobs from us for the last sure. 30 years. And, um, you know, I don't think that they're alone in terms of, you know, we've certainly seen the Democrats push in that direction as well. And uh, certainly overseas in Europe, we've, we've seen similar commentary. But, uh, but there is enough that if we start s seeing more uh, anecdotal evidence that these tariffs are really impacting the U.S. consumers and the U.S. economy, that they could look to find a shorter range trade that could, you know, maybe suffice through the 2020 elections with the promise of, and we'll be back at the negotiating table trying to get more down the road, um, you, you know, and then pointing towards the Fed for the reason why we fe why we really fell apart. Uh, you, you know, that that's definitely on the table. I, I definitely think that there's a blink possibility there. Okay, and I'm just noting, I think we're about to see an extension to the downside that could be sharp here. Um, yeah. But, yeah, uh, so, it, with that, you know, that's the most interesting question really comes down to, you look at sentiment, you look at everything else. If you imagine a universe in which this – this uh, trade war was solved, what would this market be doing right now? Like, it, this is a politically created market correction, essentially. Yeah. Um, it could turn into more. It could become a self-reinforcing feedback loop of risk aversion and all sorts of stuff. We did build up a lot of vulnerability in the cycle. The, the turtles certainly had their moments of being completely out of their shells over the last couple of years. And, and, you know, I would say we built up a lot of debt, a lot of potentially vulnerable debt. We could have a self-reinforcing uh, feedback loop um, that characterizes a cycle turn as that vulnerability gets triggered and leads to more vulnerability and counterparty risk and then risk aversion. Then you go through that process. Uh, that could happen, but without this catalyzing that, it doesn't seem like that's where we were. So it would be interesting to see if they found a way to blink faster the type of change in, in character that we might see. But just looking at strictly 
quickly, just to bring the conversation back around, just looking at strictly at sediment data, I think that um, you have a lot of neutral readings right now. Yeah. And you can't say that we are at any kind of bearish sediment extreme. But there are signs that it's a very well-protected market, which makes the downside tough, even though the downside's happening anyways. And just like I said with Jim earlier today, that's some of the toughest trading context that you can dream up when people are well, relatively well positioned for something that is nonetheless happening. Um, you just get such a choppy, grindy uh, type of move filled with lots of shakeouts, lots of moves trying to, when, when people get too bearish, they get too filled up with shorts, we squeeze them back out, and we nonetheless roll back over. And it's just a very tricky dynamic, and you really need to be, I said the other day, just tread lightly. There's a lot, the markets can be much easier than this. Yeah, so yeah, and, and, this is where you're making your year, right? And and that's the that's the key item: the fact that we are in a middling sentiment right yes. now. I mean, one would expect that we would be a lot more bearish on the sentiment data, and I, I thought that was one of the key things: the amount of neutral readings that we we're looking at at that sentiment data. Uh, but then when you see that hedging, it does make a lot more sense. But of course, that hedging could be unwound pretty quickly, and a move to the upside is certainly there. But like you said, this is a political, uh, politically fraught. Uh, decline right now. The question that I have and that I think we will eventually see, which is why I've uh, been cautious for a few weeks, is that at some point I think that this is going to work its way into order flow and um, y you know it, it, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy towards the back end of FY19 that will be driven into a recession due to a lack of capex spend uh, because of uncertainty around these tariffs. So you know I, I remain in that camp. It's very possible. One, one, one dynamic I want to point out that we haven't discussed um, is the, the the standard measure for understanding hedge fund involvement is the uh, uh, degree of correlation between hedge fund tracking indexes and the S&P. It's a simple way to look at the situation. When they start to move together, it's a sign that the uh, hedge fund exposure broadly is becoming more and more long S&P, long large cap equities, and that is one indicator that has shot higher over the course of this correction. So we are moving from a negative correlation with the S&P at the highs. So in other words, hedge funds were shorting this market, um, and now they're buying. So there's, we're starting to see, a, and, and, and this isn't smart hedge funds being smart. This is, they were shorting all the way up from December. So this is this is you know wrong 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 money broadly speaking that is now has been probably looking for a dip to cover into and to turn around and get long the market and that's what this dip is being used as for that group broadly speaking I mean this this is you know there's a lot of variety out there but the tracking indices for uh, hedge funds is starting to correlate positively with the equities market not a dramatic correlation but it is a shift from being uh, what looks like a net short to being a net long. All right. Um, let's take a look, Brett. One of the more interesting moves today, I think, was in the euro, where we really saw that aggressively rally higher. Um, at, the, at the time, the market was seeing a bit of a uh, bottom and a, a bounce off that level. But um, now we've obviously seen that roll back over. The euro, for its part, though, has maintained its strength here, got rolling up to that 111.80 area at the moment. Um, we, of course, have the EU elections, which certainly people are watching closely. Now, we're not going to get a resolution on these until the 26th is when all the final results will be out, and that's going to come over the weekend. So that is going to be a bit of potential risk uh, moving forward. But, but we've talked about the euro and the yen, of course, in, um, for leveraging uh, the carry trade of, um, and how that impacts uh, the markets and how you can use it as a risk on, risk off indicator. How are you viewing the euro right now, and are you trying to make any inferences in U.S. equities off the euro read? So what I think is going on today, first of all, there's a lot of short interest in the euro. Um, yeah, and, that's, and it's that's, the second most crowded trade, according to the uh, Bank of America fund manager survey, long right. U.S. tech being the top 
and right. the, thir and the third being long a U.S. dollar, which obviously with the euro making up 56% of the Dixie, um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so two out of the top three are essentially the same thing. Right. <laughs> and and it's, yeah. it's a thing you also see it in the uh, – in the CFTC data, it's just, it's the, you know, there's a preponderance of people who are short the euro in different ways. And, um, you know, I mean, and this is because people see the eurozone as a downside leader in any cyclical shift. Um, you know, and that makes sense. You can look at the data. It looks like eventually that's going to play out in some way. But it also makes it really kind of tricky for people who are constantly trying to really, you know, make a fortune on that breakdown and who maybe keep adding into declines and then getting squeezed out. And it's one of those patterns that looks to me like if you look over the last six months, if you've had this short euro thesis and you've traded it maybe a little too aggressively at times and you've let your emotions get the better of you, you might be right and losing money really easily. I think there's probably plenty of people in that boat. Um, and that's a you know that's a, a, a difficult dynamic, and, and that market has been plagued with with that problem. But um, I think that one of the things that we're starting to see is some of these breakouts in the dollar end up fading for the same reason that we see the January Fed funds futures showing a possibility of four cuts. You know, the idea that the euro may have been the first to cross the brink to starting to see some kind of cycle ending signs, but that you know that the U.S. might track behind that um, and, and follow it up. And, and in that case, this trade never really blossoms. There's never really a flower that blooms on this stem. If you're, you're looking for the big blow off in the dollar and the big cascading short in the euro, it's not impossible that that's at least what's happening on some of these declines. And the way that it's reversing is, is that there's a, a larger move stepping in, which is basically skeptical of the United States to be able to maintain a complete divergent condition relative to the eurozone in terms of phase of cycle. Does that make sense? And, and, yeah, no, totally. And, and again, we got those EU elections, so all of a sudden you start seeing a lot of populist parties gaining a lot of sh seats in uh, the euro. You know, there is the potential for that to cascade down heading into next weekend, and that's uh, one, one of the geopolitical uh, dangers that are out there right now. We'll have to see how that unwinds. But um, with with regards to the uh, euro, we of course continue to get weak economic data out of um, the region. The PMI numbers being the latest to uh, slip below expectations. Did you have any thoughts on those PMI readings at all, Brett? Did you get a chance to take a look at them? Yeah, I mean we're we're getting weaker and weaker, right? I mean, what are your what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, I posted the uh, preliminary comments this morning, and you know, just kind of the thing that we're seeing the most of is that growth remains either subdued or is accelerating further to the downside. I think the continued lack of inflation is certainly something that's sticking out a lot from it, where we continue to see limited uh, seller pricing power out there um, and comments about inflation just continuing to decelerate. So that's going to be one item that's really going to impact the ECB moving forward. And we just can't see – and we even saw it in Japan and Australia too. And the other item being that optimism looking forward, that remains weak. It was at a four-and-a-half-year low in the year for the eurozone wide PMI number this morning and then of course we had the US figures as well um, that came in I, I didn't see when the, it's the lowest since but they were just trudging above that 50 level which obviously is a key area oh. to keep in mind and with the ISM coming out in a little over a week on uh, June I, I believe it'll be out June 4 because June 1 is Saturday so, or June third, I sh should say. So, I got to double check that. But um, you know, I think there's going to be some concern that we could see that ISM number slip below fifty. I don't expect to, but um, there's definitely going to be um, some murmurs going through on that, which would be interesting to see how the market would react to it, as that would start showing some of those geopolitical tensions really working its way down into the economic sentiment here. Hasn't really have impacted the hard data as much, but we've certainly been seeing a slowdown of that at, at, the, at a minimum over the last few uh, at, over the last few weeks. And these these PMI numbers too, I think it's important that they do incorporate the recent commentary around trade. So yeah, right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense that you could see some feedback there. I mean, you've got to make long-term decisions for your business. 
you yep. know, and, and are, how are you going to commit to that opening that new plant or whatever um, when you don't know if there's going to be, you know, a new kind of step in the trade war that, that starts essentially targeting specific industries because China is really going to get creative to find its leverage and it could do some creative things that really, you know, come into play for people as far as their long-term planning and business and so the investments they're going to make. And that definitely could lead to, as I was saying, kind of a tripping up the cycle. Yeah, and the one outlier so far in this has been the Empire Manufacturing for May, which um, that climbed to a six-month high at 17.8, with um, manufacturing firms significantly more optimistic about the six-month outlook than they were last month. So That's not uh, interesting. It, it is, and uh, I got to double check because this was released on May 15th, and from my understanding, it did incorporate um, – that those may five headlines, but I need to double check on that because it really just doesn't correlate well with the other surveys that we're seeing. So that Empire State Manufacturing Survey could be one of the more important reads uh, in the month of June here. So, but um, you know, even there, they were talking about uh, pricing uh, indexes being little changed, and it, that really helps untie the Fed's hands if we start seeing growth concerns with no pricing uh, power, you know, that's going to give a lot more credence to Bullard, who is a voter, when he comes out and he's talking about the December rate hike being a, looking like it could be a yep. mistake. So uh, the problem would be, of course, if we start seeing uh, the president come out tweeting about the need for a rate cut, and then the Fed being backed in a little bit under the concerns that they might be looking like they're um, bowing to political pressure there. Yeah, so, right. And, and that's the last thing you want to see because all of a sudden if their integrity starts to brought into question, they're kind of looked at like the PBOC is just an extension of the uh, of the Chinese government. <laughs> then, you know, you can really see that impacted in um, yields and have an inverse effect from what you would want to see from uh, fr from bond yields where you'd expect them to be going lower. But just the demand, I mean, we've already seen China um, selling their treasuries for the last few months. Uh, we've certainly seen the last couple of um, treasury sales and direct bidders really kind of uh, falling off a little bit. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Fed is able to navigate this moving forward. Well, it doesn't seem to be much concern about that today. No. The, uh, I mean, the massive breakout in long-term treasuries today. Yeah. The upside. Yeah, and rates are just just diving and I think that that is um, I think that that's important that that's it it, it you know it, it just it doesn't it doesn't fit well with the universe in which there's not going to be some more stumble here I mean that's a yeah, I mean we got the 10-year note down um, if you look at if you were to look at the 10-year note now would be uh, the dollar sign TNX I've got it on my charts um, it's broken below it's 200 weekly moving average, and I, I, I know that moving averages don't mean as much for these interest rates, but it's really coming down into some key support levels that if we don't see it holding up, could continue to slide lower to that 2% level. Um, you're probably going to see a lot of people rushing out for uh, mortgages here, so perhaps it helps the housing market and everything. But uh, and, and the other interesting item is how that dollar index um, it's been able to remain so strong. Now, it, it, it did see a little bit of selling after it in that 24-month high, but, um, you, you know, that just strikes me as people looking for safe havens to move sure. into. Yeah. So, all right. Brett, where, uh, where should we head to next in this discussion? Um, you know, I mean, I don't know. I think we've we've covered it relatively well. I mean, you're in a situation where you have uh, just a kind of – I like to think in terms of – you know, 30,000 feet, where are you? Because, again, sentiment, we want to keep this as a sense of, like, where's the sentiment picture? It's not the it's not the be-all, end-all of what markets are going to do. But that input, what's it saying? And the important thing to remember, and I keep trying to hammer this point home, is that sentiment is only really uh, particularly important in, 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 in being a signal when it's at some kind of extreme. And we are seeing some things that are relatively extreme in, 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 in exactly the opposite manifestation that we were in a couple weeks ago. And it really characterizes.
characterized as a type of environment where there's a scare happening and people are jumping quickly into big hedges, but at the same time, we don't see panic indicators at all. So and we see lots of bigger time frame directional indicators sitting in basically humdrum, neutral, middling territory, not really telling us anything. So you need to really take your cues from the tape. Um, right now, we've got a downward trending move. We've got a huge breakout in treasuries. We've got a sense of people being already well hedged, but the market actually deteriorating. Um, and, and, you know, we can have that panic coming. It's possible to get a little bit of a panic um, and then putting in some kind of more sustainable low. And I think possibly then rebuilding sentiment into some kind of fresh topping signal down the line if we do get uh, further economic deterioration. Um, but I think that we could take another step in this process and get to the point where we get a little bit of a bearish extreme that becomes a kind of bull signal in, in, in just from a sentiment basis, but we're not there yet. So yeah. it's just continued choppy, ugly, painful kind of downside. and. Um, and you know, from a sentiment standpoint, it's 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 tough patterns. It's tough trading because you've got to lean to things in the direction that the market's moving, but it's still managing to move in that direction, and it hasn't reached an extreme. So just yeah, I would just continue to kind of say, hey, tread 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 a little bit lightly. Um, in terms of the way you're putting this on, it's a headline minefield. You don't have to be here right now. There's easy markets where you can make a bunch of money. This this really isn't one of them. Um, yeah. But if we get a panic, we do wash things out, we turn around, and we get some constructive action, you know, that squeeze could be good. Um, or, and and, and you know, I, I think also from the flip side, too, if you get a headline that, um, you know, Trump tweets that I uh, just talked to Z and, and they were laughing, um, and we saw a big spike, that sets up for a nice short, too, at the same time, I think. So, sorry, Gav, say that one more time? So what I was saying is if you get that headline that that sets off a market rally, you know, a Trump tweet that he's talking with she and that they get along great or something yeah. along the lines that they're going to meet at the G20 meeting, I, I think it does set up nicely for a, for being able to fade any yes. such of a rally on that too. So I think yeah. that's what you're looking for more than anything. Extreme moves – that would set up for, and it could go either way, either for a bounce or a fade, and that's the ideal setups I think that you're looking for in terms of this immediate market action here and being willing to hit singles and doubles. Sure. Yeah, you're going to get moments where, you know, there you've got, You've got a, a bid that comes in, and it just, with even without a headline, it just forces a shakeout. Like, right after I entered the short, we got one of those. I barely stayed in it, rolled back over. Um, you know, it's possible we get one of those right now. Just there's a bid here, even though we've got a continued feeling of kind of like a lead blanket offer sitting on the market, and the bid has to ease itself up, and then we can move to the next level. But there's the possibility of a little little short side shakeouts. And I would say pattern structure, if you're looking to take scalp trades on the short side, you you know, it is better to kind of see if you get into a lateral consolidation, you get a little bit of a shakeout to the upside. That just it's just congestion. There's just something there pausing the downside action. You build up a lot of shorts leaning on the market and then they shake themselves out. And there's the possibility of lots of little upside shakeouts like that in the middle of a downward trend. It's what we get when you have, you know, a bearish trend in the market because there's this asymmetry, you know, there's, there's still most people are long side, and when you get crowds of shorts coming in, they can just cascade themselves out, and then you roll back over. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Brett, you got anything else to add at this point, then? Uh, no, I think we pretty much covered it. I mean, you, yeah. again, 30,000 foot, you're in kind of a middling neutral type of territory with the possibility of moving to bearish extremes that present a buying opportunity. But in the meantime, you've got an ugly pattern because you've got a lot of hedges that are already built into the market. Yeah, let's, I just want to take one quick look here before we log off, make sure that we're not missing anything on feedback. Hold on a second, sorry, I'm just having computers moving a little slow here. Sorry, Brett, just having some. No problem. I don't see anything. I see one question about whether or not I'm holding it overnight. Um, okay, and there you go. I, I you know, um, I don't know the answer to that. It depends on how this plays out, but I'll definitely post. 
if it's either, you know, we get a headline that squeezes up and shakes me out or it breaks down, obviously I'll post on that. But um, otherwise, if we just kind of sit around here, then, you know, I'll let you know by the close. Okay, so there you go. We'll be on the lookout for that update. Um, Brett, as always, a pleasure talking with you. And um, I told people we'd be back on Tuesday at uh, 2.30 p.m. If, uh, Sounds good. going to work for you because obviously we're going to be closed on Monday for the Memorial Day holiday. So uh, we'll, we'll promise to get back on schedule. And I apologize for that. My uh, vacation threw off the usual scheduling for uh, this week. But uh, in general, like, I, like we've said in the past, we're going to be aiming for that Monday um, time frame for this for this cent for this uh, piece. So hopefully this was helpful. If there's any follow up questions, feel free. And we are going to be posting this uh, audio replay on the site here shortly. Okay, thanks, Gab. Talk to you soon, Brett. Okay.